know, I had the enormous pleasure of knowing uh, both uh, Professors Barnett and Oxenberg, uh, who are acknowledged to be uh, two of America's finest China scholars. In the 80s, when uh, Doak Barnett was a scholar at the Brookings Institution, I served as a member of the Brookings Board of Trustees. And I was very impressed with his book, China Economy and the Global Perspective, published by Brookings. And in the early 90s, we crossed paths often at uh, meetings of the National Committee of the U.S.-China Relations, and uh, at uh, where he was the organizational uh, member and served as a chairman. No question about it. His knowledge of China was deep and broad, as was his generosity of spirit. And Michael Oxenberg and I became friends while serving as board members of the National Committee and attending events of the Council of Foreign Relations and the Trilateral Commission. His humor and grace made him loved by all who knew him, and many of uh, the observations that he made in his book, Shaping U.S.-China Relations, A Long-Term Strategy, could be uh, uh, usefully applied today. Both men moved easily in the worlds of academe and uh, policy, during his lifetime, beginning with President Lyndon Johnson, Doe advised every administration about China and the importance of establishing and maintaining a strong bilateral relationship. He is believed by many to have been one of the voices influencing President Nixon to make the overtures to China that led to the signing of the 1972 Shanghai Communique and paved the way for restoring uh, diplomatic relations. And Mike served as Nash in the, uh, the National Security Administration under the big Brzezinski in the Carter Administration and was a member of the delegation that traveled to China for the signing of the uh, joint communique on the establishment of diplomatic relations on January 1, 1979. Both men believed in comprehensive engagement and urged patience and understanding in pursuing solutions to tough problems. In the intervening years, the Sino-American relationship has broadened and deepened in ways that few would have imagined in those early years. However, all of us who care deeply about the bilateral relationship are concerned by the unexpected frictions that have surfaced in recent months. Some of the friction is a natural result of the fact that the relatively clear-cut bipolar challenges of the Cold War have been replaced by new complex 21st century transnational challenges, nuclear proliferation, pandemics, terrorism, drug trafficking, and climate change, and involve many, many more players. But I of the political pressures and the competing interests that are driving the other side, that makes it more difficult to figure out how to bridge our policy differences. We need to talk more to achieve a better understanding. China has become much stronger economically, geopolitically, and militarily. For three decades, it has averaged double-digit growth. Last year, in the midst of a global recession, China grew close to 9%, maintaining its position as the world's fastest growing economy. This year, China is likely to replace Japan as the world's second largest economy and its largest trading nation. Increasingly, the questions are raised. Can the world's biggest 
and the fastest growing economies constructively work together to enhance our future prosperity and stability? Or have our increasingly competitive economies, along with the differences in our histories, forms of government, and domestic sensitivities, become too great to enable us to harness our respective strengths to deal effectively with today's bilateral and global challenges. Like the men we honor here tonight, I am an optimist. I believe we can, should, and must work constructively together. And more importantly, I believe that by doing so, we can build habits of cooperation that will help us deal effectively with the new challenges as they arise, which will not only enhance the well-being of the people of China and the people of the United States, but will contribute meaningfully to global peace and stability. Initially, when uh, I was invited to speak, given my interests and my background, I intended to focus my remarks on economic challenges and opportunities affecting our relationship, rather than foreign policy and strategic issues. But the disagreements that have arisen recently over basic foreign policy issues inevitably affect how we deal with economic issues. And for that reason, I have broadened the focus of my remarks. I have been advised to be candid, so I will be, in order to explain why I believe that it is important for both sides to take steps to moderate these frictions. <coughs> Let me start by assessing the policy differences that have existed over a number of years and recently have become more rancorous. Take uh, the February 2nd announcement that President Obama would meet with the Dalai Lama, a decision that was communicated to the Chinese leadership before the announcement. Every, sit every sitting U.S. President over the past two decades has met with the Dalai Lama. China has consistently expressed its disapproval but Americans were, quite frankly, astonished by China's unprecedented level of anger over President Obama's scheduled meeting. Our differing views of the meeting are undoubtedly shaped by our differing values, cultures, and politics. For the Chinese, the Dalai Lama symbolizes the tensions in Tibet, and that it sees as a challenge to its national sovereignty and its unity. For the Americans, the Dalai Lama is a respected international religious leader. When presidents uh, meet unofficially with such individuals, the meeting symbolizes the religious openness, openness that is so basic to our culture. A refusal to meet would have subjected President Obama to harsh criticism from Americans of uh, all political persuasions. Again, last month, the announced uh, arms sales to, uh, by the United States to uh, Taiwan generated an outburst of anger by China that took most Americans by surprise. Every administration since 1979, when we normalized U.S.-China relations, has sold arms to Taiwan, pursuant to the Taiwan Relations Act, which was signed just four months after our two governments normalized their diplomatic relations. In that act, our Congress required the United States to provide Taiwan with arms of a defensive character. As with the meeting with the Dalai Lama, the Obama administration advised China before it was publicly announced that it would implement an arms sale agreement. It was actually negotiated in 2008 
to sell $6.4 billion of arms to Taiwan, which included uh, interceptor missiles, helicopters, and communications equipment, but did not include the F-16s that had been requested. The President would have paid a very high political cost had he refused to move forward with this agreement. Now, in his anger, China threatened sanctions against the companies selling the equipment and the withdrawal of cooperation on international issues. In my view, it was especially regrettable that it also suspended planned high-level military exchanges and postponed the agreed visits later this year by the U.S. Defense Secretary Bob Gates, as well as scheduled talks between Chen Pengdi, the Chinese People Liberation Army's Chief of General Staff, and Admiral Michael Mullins, the Chairman of the U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff. Where our two governments have disagreements over matters of defense, it is particularly important for our military leaders to meet and to discuss those differences. That is not happening today. A habit of regularly holding such meetings might well have moderated the rancor over the arms sale to Taiwan. Most experts, Chinese and American, believe that trust between our military forces is much lower than exists in other areas of our relationship. The number and level of joint military exchanges lags far behind the number and level of exchanges our two governments have established to discuss economic and other policy issues. The weakness of our military relationship was acknowledged uh, at the July Strategic and Economic Dialogue where both sides agreed that additional such exchanges should take place. It was again recognized during the Obama WHO meeting this past November, where two pres the two presidents agreed in a joint statement to actively implement various military exchanges, increasing the level and frequency to foster greater understanding of each other's intentions environment. Now, our military leaders may continue to disagree on issues, but regular and candid face-to-face -face discussion could help explain the reasons for the actions taken by each side, reduce the possibilities for miscalculation, and provide a form in which to resolve misunderstandings. Very dialogue. Bring our military leaders to together on a relative, on a regular basis, to talk about issues like Taiwan, and there are others. In that case, perhaps they might reach an agreement that would see the Chinese reducing or pulling back the number of missiles in Fujian that are pointed at Taiwan, and the Americans reducing or downgrading future sales. To, uh, defensive weapons to Taiwan. As a policy backdrop, one cannot help but notice and be pleased that in recent years, Taiwan and China have built a much stronger economic bond. President Ma ying has been a pervasive voice for increasing social and economic interactions across the strait. He has been an advocate for the Economic Cooperation Framework Agreement, which uh, would reduce bilateral tariffs and increase trade opportunities between Taiwan and the mainland. He has also sought to reduce domestic political friction with his declaration of no independence, no unification, and no use of force. Some Americans who closely study Taiwan politics believe that had the United States reneged on the arms sales agreement, 
the fact would have been used against President Ma by his political opponents and continue to agitate for independence. And the United States and China both share an interest in a harmonious cross-strait relations that President Ma supports. With regularly held dialogues, our military leaders could share their assessments of the political setting in which decisions involving defense by both sides are made. We to withdraw cooperation with respect to unrelated international issues such as the development of nuclear weapons in North Korea and Iran. Although neither the United States nor China want North Korea or Iran to become the nuclear powers, China assesses both threats as lower than does the United States. Our different assessments of the risk further underscore the need for and the value of increasing the number and frequency of joint military dialogue. With respect to North Korea, it is well known that it has developed and tested a nuclear bomb. It has built a nuclear reactor in Syria, and it has sent component uh, chemicals to Libya. Many defense experts in the United States believe that North Korea's greatest threat is its willingness to export nuclear bombs, material, or technology for cash. China is best situated to discover any attempt by North Korea to ship a nuclear product to the Middle East, which would create a major global risk. To reduce that risk, our governments should be working together with Japan, Russia, and South Korea, members of the six-party talks, to obtain North Korea's agreement to what has been called the three no's. No, ex no export of nuclear weapons or materials, no building of additional bombs, and no more testing, which could advance North Korea's ability to build a more sophisticated bomb. The international community, including the United States, is also highly concerned about Iran's nuclear enrichment program. Iran claims that it's enriching uranium for fuel, but has failed to respond to proposals from the five permanent members of the United Nations Security Council, which includes both China and the United States, to swap Iran's low enriched uranium for processed nuclear fuel. Iran's development of a nuclear weapon would be enormously destabilizing in the Middle East. Cooperation between our two governments and our respective militaries to limit the nuclear ambitions of North Korea and Iran is not a favor that China grants to the United States, but rather a global challenge that must be met with global leadership. And I'm concerned that China's highly publicized threat to refuse to cooperate with the United States to find solutions to global challenges because of unresolved bilateral disputes put at risk not only China's reputation as a global problem solver, but also the world's prospect for future peace and stability. We will continue to have strategic and foreign policy issues where we do not agree. But we should talk about them candidly, listen carefully, and try hard to bridge the gaps. And that applies as well to economic issues. We share interests in a number of serious economic challenges, two of the most critical today, being the need to rebalance the global economy and the need to keep global markets open in the face of mounting economic nationalism. Take the enormous problem created by the serious imbalance in the global economy. It has grown over the past years, a decade or so, 
because Germany, Japan, China, and other Asian economies have built their growth on expert, exports. Whereas the United States, the United Kingdom, and Spain have relied excessively on domestic consumption, particularly in the housing sector, to fuel their economic growth. And although investment excesses in the financial sector triggered the financial crisis in 2008, there is general agreement that the global imbalance made the crisis much, much worse. As stated last year by Gerald Corrigan, former president of the New York Federal Reserve, it is highly likely that these imbalances would create a serious macroeconomic problem even if we had not had the fiscal problem. If we are to protect against future global financial crises, the global economy must be brought into better balance. And that will require debtor and creditor nations to alter their existing economic models to put their economies on a more sustainable growth plan. Debtor nations cannot continue to consume at excessive, excessive levels as in the past, and creditor nations must look more to their own consumers to fuel their economic growth. That means the United States must stop its consumption binge and reduce its soaring deficit fueled by excessive government and household spending. And China will need to reduce its reliance on exports and investments, particularly in heavy industry, as its principal sources of economic growth. A commitment by the United States to undertake the structural reforms necessary to achieve more balanced growth is not a favor granted to China, nor is a decision by China to stimulate domestic consumption a favor granted to the United States. The policy corrections that each needs to make are necessary to ensure each nation's future financial stability and prosperity. For if the corrections are not made, the global imbalance will likely ignite another economic crisis in the future. Global balance is more likely to be restored if the world's largest debtor nation and its largest surplus nation take the lead in implementing corrective measures. While necessary, these changes will not be politically popular. But having the United States and China take corrective action in a similar time frame is likely to reduce the political friction in both countries. We all know that the necessary policy changes cannot be implemented overnight. That each of our governments if each of our governments were to commit to specific structural reform and spell out the specific steps that each would take with time frames where appropriate and provide periodic updates regarding their progress, perhaps at meetings of the uh, G20, that would boost confidence in the uh, future health and prosperity of the uh, a global market, which in turn would help keep our respective domestic economies on a sustainable growth path. In the United States, that means that both the public and the private sectors will have to curtail their spending and increase their savings in response to the crisis. The private sector has increased its savings by roughly 5%. But the federal government's budget has grown by 5%. That's offsetting the increase in private saving. Going forward, the U.S. government needs to commit to bring its primary budget into balance in a specified period of time, say five years, and its overall deficit into balance in a specified period of time, say 10 years. And it must reinstitute 
the pay-as-you-go program enforced by a process that limits future unfunded, unfunded spending and requires any gaps to be filled by tax initiatives. It will also need to restructure the entitlement program, like Social Security, to take account of longer lifespan. The political response to these changes will be highly unpopular, but it will protect Americans from what could be an even more serious uh, recession down the road. And going forward, China's government has a number of policy instruments to encourage an increase in domestic consumption to fuel its future economic growth. As Drs. Lardy and Goldstein document in their well-written study entitled The Future of China's Exchange Rate Policy, fiscal, financial, exchange rate, and price are four policy instruments that China could use to reduce the preference given to large companies, particularly state-owned companies, that invest in heavy industry and manufactured goods or export. For example, correcting China's underpricing of land, energy, capital, and water would discourage excessive investment in heavy industries like aluminum, iron, steel, cement that rely upon those production factors. More equitable pricing of those factors, particularly capital, would encourage the development of small and medium-sized enterprises that are the backbone of job creation, which in turn would help moderate the wage gap between the urban and rural workers. And using fiscal, financial, exchange rate, and price instruments to reduce China's reliance on heavy industry and export is likely to be opposed by those interests who benefit from the system as it is. But changing the system would greatly benefit the Chinese people. Yet many in China are unaware of what is at stake. It is a surprise to many Chinese that its top five heavy ind industries are the most energy intensive, using over 40% of China's energy demand and creating most of the pollution, and yet employ fewer than 2% of China's workforce. According to the 2006 report of China's Environmental Protection Agency, the cost of environmental degradation cost China between 8 and 13 percent of its GDP, costs 750,000 lives each year, and is responsible for China's chronic shortage of clean water and has resulted in soil pollution by heavy metals that have destroyed thousands of acres of arable far farmland. In short, our two governments, by taking on this challenge to rebalance their respective economies, could turn it into an opportunity to deliver very substantial benefits to their respective populations. Also, they would gain the additional benefit of helping to correct the global imbalance, a major factor in creating the Great Recession, and thus help to ensure people against future economic turmoil. We cannot forget that in the 1930s, the worldwide depression resulted from a toxic combination of a severe global economic imbalance and a near universal increase in trade barriers. Keeping our bilateral markets open while working to further open global markets is a challenge that, if addressed seriously, would enhance the growth of our domestic economies while contributing to the expansion and stability of the global economy. As headlines in our respective newspapers document, Bilateral trade disputes have multiplied over the past six months. 
The United States has taken action to restrict the imports of Chinese tires, steel pipe, magazine quality paper, various salts, while China has moved to restrict U.S. movies and books, poultry, auto parts, nylon, industrial assets, and threatened to commence an investigation of U.S. passenger car. These actions are not helpful. At each of the G20 meetings, the assembled leaders pledged not to erect barriers to imports, not to violate the WTO rules, and not to impose export restrictions. Yet the report published last September by Global Trade Alert documents that the G20 members have put in place over 120 blatantly discriminatory uh, trade measures and that nearly that many are in the pipeline. The United States and China are among the offenders. Well, this sort of protectionism will not be stopped by pledges, whether at the G20 meeting or any other meeting. It could be stopped if our two governments took the lead at the upcoming G20 meeting to press for a real commitment to carry out the leader's promise to keep their markets open and themselves set an example. In addition, the United States and China could work together to push the Doha round to a successful conclusion and so doing create new and exciting opportunities for Chinese and American entrepreneurs while giving the global economy a real boost. According to studies conducted at the Peterson Institute for International Economics, tariff cuts for agriculture and industrial goods hundred billion dollars a year and we need that growth now open markets make a difference it is thanks to open markets that china has averaged double digit growth for the past three decades and created the jobs necessary to lift hundreds of millions of people out of poverty economic nationalism when unemployment is high Public pressure escalates to raise protective barriers against incoming goods, services, and investment. And we need to resist those pressures, for we know that they will decrease economic opportunity and increase hostility. A successful resistance will require all of us to make a concerted effort to educate our population, our fellow citizens, on how opening markets stimulates economic growth, creates opportunity, and enhances global stability. Too few people in both the United States and China appreciate the extent to which legal and regulatory barriers limit development and creative endeavor. They need to hear from our leaders in government, universities, think tanks, businesses, groups represented here this afternoon. How keeping domestic and global markets open is critical to their future prosperity, their future prosperity. For all these issues that China and the United States face today, whether foreign policy, military, or economic, is overwhelmingly in our national interest to maintain a close, candid, collaborative, constructive relationship. As President Obama has said, the relationship between the United States and China will shape the 21st century. Through engagement, we're more likely to find solutions to our differences and turn our challenges into opportunities. We know that high-level engagement works. Between 2006 and 2008, cabinet officials from both of our governments met two days, twice a year, in what was called the Strategic Economic Dialogue. The goal was to discuss complex, long-standing 
economic challenges and to craft solutions satisfactory to both governments. Since both of our governments are quite compartmentalized and have different organizational structures, these meetings brought together the relevant high-level officials on both sides to talk about critical issues. And these face-to-face -face meetings enable both sides to better understand the concerns of their counterparts and led to a number of positive outcomes. Importantly, such meetings help to avoid having to initiate talks among strangers in the heat of a crisis. In 2009, the Obama administration broadened the economic dialogue to cover strategic as well as economic issues. And last July's two-day meeting showed that the newly formed strategic and economic dialogue to be an effective forum for raising and discussing issues of mutual concern. Next meeting will be held in late May or early June. My personal view is that the strategic and economic dialogue should be held more frequently than every 10 to 11 months, particularly now that the agenda is broader, challenges are greater, and the, there are more participants. There is no substitute for face-to-face -face meetings to increase understanding, and relationships matter. Both Doak Barnett and Mike Oxenberg believed in engagement. As they said, it requires patience and understanding. And our two great nations working together could shape history in a very positive way by making the tough decisions today that would ensure international peace and prosperity and a better life for our people tomorrow. We will continue to have our differences. But let us recall the Chinese problem. Unless there is an opposing wind, the kite cannot rise. Thank you. Let me introduce you, uh, Professor Tsang Yu Wen. He's the director of World Economy, uh, SASS, and also chairman of World Economy Academy. Uh, he is in Shanghai, but people call him uh, Shanghai's uh, Nicholas Lani, if not China's Nicholas Lani, is an expert on U.S.-China relations. Thank you. Today, the Hughes bus is my gentleman. I'm very happy to be invited to this meeting to discuss the Hughes bus's speech and the experience. 特别是对中美关系在当代世界经济当中、当代世界当中它的重要性所做的评价是正确。第二，我体会，大师的演讲具有重要价值，是直接的针对了中美双方共同关系的问题，指出了中美双方缺乏理解，应当为政策弥补差距、弥补差异。或者说，在英文当中，那就是为差距搭建桥梁，需要更多的以交流来增进理解。大师强调，两个国家应当更多的接触和对话，这是完全正确的。今天大师这样的演讲，正是这样一种有益的、可以增进理解的这样一种交流。那么我们知道，今天也正好是两位重要的白宫客人前来北京访问，进行一种交流。那么，在中美关系出现了不利局面，这个时候能够进行这样一种比较客观的学术分析，是完全有益的。第三，我完全同意 h i l l s t a r s 在他演讲的第一部分的最后所说的话。他说：“中美两国将继续会在战略与外交问题上无相一致，但是。”我们就这些问题进行坦诚的
对话，细心的听取对方的意见。我们看到，可惜的是，奥巴马政府没有能够听取中国方面在事先的一再提醒，使得对台军售、未经答案这样一类事情皆有发生。这些问题都明显的涉及了中国的国家的核心利益。常识告诉我们，外交问题关系到一个国家的整体利益，它在优先的顺序上，应当是超越一个国家国内某一集团利益。这个演讲当中，感到启发的和值得注意的几个观点。第一，关于全球经济的不平衡问题，大使从中国国内发展战略、政治上提出了要改变过度依赖于外部市场和对外不平衡问题，是有启发的和引人深思。大使正确的提出了中美两国经济增长战略的调整，会有利于两个国家，也有利于世界各国。指出了两个大国国内发展模式的国际影响，也是有启示。当然，我也认为，中美两国并不是世界不平衡的全部来源，而只是代表了世界的两种发展模式、发展典型。因为其他国家在不同程度上也是这样，就是对外的贸易不平衡。第二个问题。那就是关于中国发展战略调整问题。我完全同意大使所说的，中国应当扩大内需，用财政、金融、汇率和价格四种政策工具去减少对投资于这个重工业公司和制造业产品出口这样一种优惠。中国能源的高消耗和这个发展所导致的污染问题。确实是非常严重。这些中国的持续增长，这些问题对中国的持续增长是非常重要的。那么事实上，前几年中国也已经开始了发展战略的重大的调整，但是金融危机中断了，在一定程度上影响了这样的进程。保就业保增长成为最大主题。我们有理由相信，中国所提出的。这样一些目标，在抵御危机当中转变发展方式，这样目标今后几年会有新的成果。第三个问题，我想提出几个问题，请教一大师与各位共同的探讨。大师虽然只讲了全球不平衡和贸易保护这两大问题，但实际上涉及了当代国际经济、中国经济大量问题或者。主要问题，首先第一点，关于世界经济的不平衡问题。当代世界经济的不平衡，我认为跟上一个世纪三十年代是有区别的。表面上来看是贸易的不平衡，但实际上是由全球的生产转移所造成。三十年代并不是这样。那么中国的出口当中，包含了美国。以及其他国家的中间产品，包括了在中国投资者的收益，只有一小部分是中国自己的工资收入和土地的收入，也就是说，不能把中国的全部出口收益看作为中国的收入，所有各国都在中国获得收益，这是中国今天贸易的性质。与此同时，中美两国对外经济关系的不平衡问题，也值得我们关注。中国的巨额的贸易顺差，巨巨额的外汇储备，被看作为是这场危机的原因之一，只是缺乏理论基础，是基于过时的理论所得出的结论。因为今天我们是经济全球化的时代，经济全球化的最重要特征是什么呢？那就是国际的资本流动、产业的转移，从而。贸易的流向出现大的调整。从长期来看
中美两国这样的模式是不可持续的，也就是说，严重的对外不平衡。如果中国长期不能有效的使用出口盈余、进口先进设备、提升产业结构，而是继续的靠廉价劳动力出口低端产品，那么中国的发展将长期是低水平，世界市场将更加无法承受中国的出口。中国自己的发展也是不可持续的。中国的出口收入、外部的闲置，会影响中国自身的发展。美国的国债不断上升，更是不可持续。那么我们如何来看这场危机的成因呢？今天我们不是要从责任上，而是要从学术上去探讨这个问题。中国的巨额贸易顺差，原因之一是中国缺乏有效的国内投资机制和能力，于是呢，就把外汇的基于购买了美国的国债。不论中国的外汇储备是采用了购买美国国债的形式，还是储蓄在国际银行的这样一种存款形式，如果美国的投资者把这些存款，有效的运用实体经济，不出现过度的发展，那么也就不会导致这场金融危机。那么我们在生活当中可以这个这样一个比喻：在一般经济生活当中，一个靠工资收入的人，如果他不会投资，那么他就会把工资的借余存在银行；而另一个人从银行借的钱去进行投资，犯了错误，亏损了，或者他借的钱去赌博破产了。那么，是不是储蓄的人要为投资赌博失败的人负责呢？作为新兴市场经济体的中国，长期的贸易顺差是当前发展阶段的一个必须的，转变为中长期，当然不是永久性。一方面，新兴经济体通过引进外资，以外贸拉动经济增长，这是一种基本的发展模式。另一方面，更重要的是，发达国家通过投资，把制造基地放在新兴经济体当中，就必然会导致新兴经济体出口大大高于进口，特别是采用加工贸易机制。对此，与此对应的是，发达国家投资流出大大超过流入。我们必须指出，这些出口顺差当中。包含了发达国家的巨大收益，而并不是全部是像中国这样新兴市场经济的收益。发达国家投资者在新兴经济体产权的扩大，本国公司货币收入的增长，美国的国债与新兴经济体的外贸顺差，都有着客观原因，将是长期。当然不是永久，因为美国所承担了许多的国际事务，新兴市场经济体目前正处于引进外资、靠外贸创造就业这样的发展阶段，所以还会持续相当的时期。最后一方面问题是关于市场开放问题，我非常赞同大使关于坚持开放市场、反对贸易保护主义的观点。增加机会和增强全球的稳定，中美两国应当率先承诺和开放市场。我非常赞同大使关于市场开放的主张。这里我不想分析中美贸易摩擦是否美国贸易保护主义的结果，但是我也很遗憾地说，在美国有另外一种声音，主张对中国搞贸易保护。更重要的是，这种言论来自于一位著名的美国经济学家、诺贝尔经济学奖获得者保罗·克鲁格曼。今年的元旦，克鲁格曼教授在《纽约时报》上发表了专栏文章《中国的新年》。所谓“中国的新年”，在克鲁格曼看来，是因为二零一零年世界的焦点将是。因为中国追求出口顺差。
所谓被他称为重商主义的这样一种贸易政策，引起的世界贸易保护主义浪潮。一，中国对外贸易的结构与胜差的来源。格曼教授的基本观点是，其根本原因是人民币汇率低估。那么，如果我们具体分析一下中国的贸易结构和贸易生产的来源，就可以发现这个结论是错误。中国的统计表明，我用十年的统计来更好的说明这个问题。从一九九九年到二零零八年十年当中，中国对外贸易总出口当中百分之五十二点二是加工贸易。百分之四十七点八是一般贸易，十年的贸易顺差总额是一万亿美元多一点，其中来自加工贸易的顺差总额是一万两千五百亿美元，而一般贸易呢是逆差，并不是顺差，总额是两千五百多亿。那么我们大家都知道，加工贸易的顺差。是必然的，关键是汇率同时影响加工贸易的进出口。不管汇率水平怎么样，以国内增加值来创造、来创汇，这样一个加工贸易的基本特点，决定了加工贸易总是正常。要求加工贸易实现平衡，等于是说中国的国内工资为零，土地价格为零，那是不现实。人民币汇率再怎么样升值，加工贸易永远是正常。相反，中国的一般贸易是逆差。如果要按照克鲁格曼的主张，那么中国不应当是让人民币升值，当相反而应该贬值。第二个问题，关于中国的汇率水平和它对世界的利弊问题，克鲁格曼和不少的美国学者认为，人民币汇率是低估的。并且把这样一种低估看作对世界的损害。那么，人民币汇率是不是低估？我今天在这里不多讨论。即使退一步说，中国的产品确实是靠汇率低估，挤占了他国的市场，影响也是两面的。中国的出口方因为低汇率而降低了出口价格，外国的进口方和消费者是真正的获益者。从投资角度来说，中国的低估汇率还直接导致了外商对华直接投资，所以，必，因为更低的人民币汇率，使外国投资者在中国批注土地、支付工资和购买中间品，外汇的成本更低。这也就是为什么外贸大量的外资大量的涌入中国这样一个原因，重要原因。因此，不应当只看到人民币汇率低估。对美国生产上的竞争压力，也应该看到这对美国消费者和对华投资者所带来的巨大收益。在经济全球化的新的历史条件下，贸易、投资、跨国生产等各种形式的国际经济关系大发展，汇率绝不只是与贸易一个因素相关。换句话说，在投资全球化的世界经济当中。贸易平衡不再是衡量一个国家汇率水平是否合理的主要指标，更不是唯一指标。中国出口能力的提升，主要来自于外商在华投资，外资把中国纳入了全球生产的这样的体系当中，可销售的高级的生产要素，而中国提供了加工型的简单劳动力、土地、自然资源等低端要素。外国资本流入，中国制造流出，不再是对外经济关系是非的唯一的表现。所以，如果继续贸易平衡这样传统观念来评价，显然是不合时宜。最后，第三个问题，我们如何看中国在危机中的贡献？克鲁格曼教授说，在当前世界经济不景气的时候。中国保持了高贸易生产，始终掠夺其他国家工作岗位的行为。在克鲁格曼看来，中国的低汇率政策和贸易顺差，将使世界难以走出这个危机。实际上，这个完全是错误
，在金融危机当中，二零零九年，中国为世界经济贡献了零点六个百分点，证明超过了新兴市场经济整体一点一个百分点的一半。中国的贡献来自于国内扩大内需的政策。克鲁格曼说，中国夺取了、掠夺了美国的就业岗位。我们说，这是经济全球化的结果，这是一个中长期的历史发展的一个过程。我们不可能要求在危机发生的时候，让中国的劳动岗位重新回到美国国内，这是不可能进行的，才经过调整。最后，我所要说的，我们不希望克鲁格曼这样的保护主义在美国。真的流行起来。我们希望具有像希尔斯大师这样主张开放市场的专家，能够在美国站住脚跟。谢谢。Now with、uh, Ambassador Hughes or、uh, Professor Chang Yuwen, Wu Xinbo, first. Today, the most. Thank you very much, Ambassador Hughes, for your speech. Uh, you mentioned uh, both issues of U.S. arms sale to Taiwan as well as、uh, President Obama's meeting uh, with uh, Dalai Lama. These are not、uh, new issues; they are old issues. But what's new is the context of U.S.-China relations, which is a、uh, deepening partnership and growing cooperation between two countries. So my question is: Given the new、uh, context of U.S.-China relations. Do you think、uh, whether the United States should handle the old issues in a new way that shows more respect for China and also more sensitivity to China-U.S. relations? Thank you. It is not new.、Uh, they have、uh, gone on from、uh, for several decades in both instances, and、uh, the context is the fact is that our relationship has been improving. Over the decades, we want to keep it improving. My point is simple. I think to continue to meet on a more regular and frequent basis would enable us to understand better the sensitivities on both sides, and there are sensitivities on both sides as to both issues. I tried to spell them out. Americans feel very strongly they made a commitment to Taiwan, not that it would stay separate. It did not address that issue. It encouraged the parties to get together, but what it did guarantee is that reunification would not be done by force. And in 1979, our Congress ordered the administration, through statute, to provide defensive weapons. Now that offends the Chinese and has traditionally offended the Chinese. And our military should talk about whether or not the level of assistance of defensive weapons and the level of risk of a problem has decreased, and whether or not we can address the issue and take into account the sensitivity. But we are not talking. And that is a problem. And I think with the Dalai Lama, it comes down to values. It's a, a bilateral issue, but Americans are sensitive too. Americans are very sensitive about、uh, their, their religious opening. When the Pope comes, he doesn't get an official visit. He gets an unofficial visit, meeting with the president, whether he's Catholic or not Catholic. When the Dalai Lama comes, he is recognized as a respected religious leader, not as a political leader. And we are sensitive as a people that we would not meet with a respected international religious leader. Now we have a differing view on these two issues. We should talk about it and see whether we can soften it. But neither side should be angry that the other side doesn't capitulate to their view. And in families, you have differences of opinion, 
but you learn to live with the differences of opinion and try to build on where you have a convergence of opinion. And I think that's important because I think we are two great nations and two great friends. And what we contribute together will be much greater than what either of us can contribute separately. And my friend uh, mentioned we live in a globalized world. Globalized issues that we face today cannot be solved by China alone. Cannot be solved by the United States alone. It will take our joint effort. And our joint effort will make our people, Chinese and Americans, more prosperous and more secure. So that's what we have to try to build. And not focus so much on the differences where our cultures, sensitivities, politics, and values drive us apart. We should understand, but we should also try to build for future harmony. Oh, I simply raise your question, not uh, to give uh, comments. Uh, yes, with moving up here. <laughs> Okay, you, and you. All right. Funny, the other day, um, Warren Bach from Scandic Source, and I was walking by a coffee shop, and there was some member of AmCham inviting me in to sit with her, and she asked me about the Dalai Lama. And I simply said, the White House is in America. We're an independent country. We have the right to talk to whoever we want to. Uh, I think it's a matter, of course, dialogue, but understanding of the system in America. For example, if the FDA rules that a medicine from China or anywhere else cannot be on the American market, the president cannot override it. If America gives asylum to a Chinese dissident, the president cannot send an imperial guard to deport that person. We have separation of Excuse powers. You, you have your question or you have uh, It was just a comment. And uh, I think the understanding of the system is very important. <coughs> Ambassador Hills. Given America's structural economic difficulties and the high cost of maintaining a global military presence in the post-Cold War world, why is Taiwan a vital interest of the U.S.? And of what relevance is the Taiwan's Relation Act in this day when the head of the Kuomintang can freely visit China? Global military presence in the post-Cold War world. I have two questions. Number one is, why is Taiwan still a vital interest of the, of the United States? And of what relevance is the Taiwan Relations Act to the U.S. in a day and age when you can get on a plane today and, and be in Taipei for supper, when, when the head of the KMT, the former uh, enemy of the, the Communist Party, freely visits China to discuss issues with his communist counterparts. Uh, so I'm wondering if, uh, if we should have a new policies for the post-Cold War world with the U.S.-China relations. I'm sorry, the acoustics were such that I didn't quite get your words, but as I understand it, your inquiry is why in this day and age, with the United States, with all of the challenges that it has, uh, regard Taiwan as a vital interest. I think it's a question of uh, the law that, is passed, that was passed, a congressional law that has uh, the support of our Congress, and a view that we made a commitment to China and to Taiwan. We removed our recognition of Taiwan and moved it to China. There was a condition. It was a condition that was uh, spoken in an ambiguous way, an elegant ambiguity, if you will, where China said, Taiwan is part of China. And the United States said, we know China believes that Taiwan is part of China. We understand that. 
But if there is an effort to unify by force, we will defend Taiwan. So negotiate, and we hope that you are able to resolve your differences. But do not do it by force. Now, is that a vital interest? It's an international commitment. If you renege on your international commitments, you lose credibility. Would we want to have a conflict across the strait? Would that add to our peace and stability in the world today? I think not. So, again, I'm not saying that I personally favor selling arms to Taiwan. If our two, two governments, sophisticated governments, could sit down and work out how they might have a transition. And keep in mind, as I mentioned, is not time appropriate? Is it not remarkable that the president of Taiwan is reaching out to the mainland, creating stronger economic bonds? Is it time for a, a, a propitious movement by all sides? And you're going to get there by talking. I, I want to call you to here is to explain to this audience why President Obama should meet uh, uh, Dalai Lama and continue himself. This does not mean she uh, was for, the, for this. <laughs> Just want to explain to you, and may, may a Chinese audience may not agree with that. But uh, we need, just because we have differences over this, this issue. So, Carla Hughes strongly suggested we should sit together, especially we need to have two military leaders to sit together, as we have, uh, we have had this morning a round table discussion. That, that's her, uh, her intention. Uh, that's, uh, shift a little bit uh, from Taiwan and the Dalai Lama, <laughs> if you have, okay. So I explain to you what, what uh, uh, Ambassador Hughes' intention. Yes. Uh, please, brief, okay. Yes, sir. Ryan Anchor, <laughs> University of California, Udon University. Um, my question is for Professor Zhang Yo Wen. Um, I'm wondering, in order to equalize uh, the unhealthy trade balance between U.S. and China, uh, what's more important for increasing domestic consumption within China? Is it more important to uh, provide better social safety nets uh, in order to allow individuals from worrying so much about saving for the future? Or is it more important to uh, improve the financial sector to increase consumer lending? <laughs> 提问者本身的观点是正确的中国要减少对外部市场的依赖应该扩大内需那么其中包括建立更好的社会保障网络就是中国国内投资机制不成熟银行里有钱企业没有能力把它变成投资而同时却要依靠外来的投入所以这个机制不改变中国还可能更多的依赖外资和外部市场所以我完全同意你的观点was to conclude the you yeah, right? You want, you want to? Are you, are you, who, who would like to raise their questions? And then when the last one, okay. Jim Barris, uh, yes, you. Oh, sure, global economic rebalancing and all that. And is it possible, in your view, Ambassador Gills, 
is China truly end up rebalancing the economy and depend far more on internal consumption? Will it be possible that by that time, the outside influence on China will be diminished? Because economic relations influence the political outcome as well. Thank you. Consumption does not mean that China withdraws from the world. The uh, domestic consumption in China is 35% of GDP. That's the lowest of any large developing country ever in the history. Uh, and uh, it has actually dropped over the past several years. People believe that the uh, uh, low deposit rates, which is where most people uh, earn their money, is because of uh, inflation actually losing money. And yet, the interest rates afforded to large companies that export are very uh, advantageous. So that the table is tilted against the consumer. I would think that uh, China would benefit from uh, a credit regime. And uh, Professor Zhang suggested that, that interest rates, uh, if interest rates were raised, the savers who are saving 50% uh, um, of GDP, uh, they would get a return. That would encourage the development of small and medium-sized enterprises and help produce the consumer market. Uh, the Chinese Academy of Social, Service, uh, Social Sciences has produced a report that shows that less than 20% today of small and medium-sized enterprises have access to capital, less than 20%. And yet, the existing small and medium-sized enterprises contribute 60% to China's GDP, 50% of the taxes, and 80% of the jobs. When I talk to Chinese friends, they tell me, we need jobs. And we need the taxes, the revenues. And we need our uh, GDP to grow. Well then, it would seem, based upon the figures that Chinese have developed, is you want to stimulate small and medium-sized enterprises. And that could be done, one way, is by uh, having more equitable credit available to savers. Uh, Right. Uh, Ambassador, thank you for your speech. Uh, here, I don't want to uh, argue with you uh, the justification uh, of meeting Dalai Lama or uh, MCO. You should or should not. I just want to you have a second thought. Uh, has Obama think, uh, thought of the severe consequence after his uh, two events? Could he do it better, especially after his visit, after the so high expectation of uh, uh, more cooperative for U.S.-China relations? Thank you. Okay, I think uh, time is uh, uh, approaching the conclusion time, but uh, actually behind the schedule by minutes. The, as the moderator, I would like to take this opportunity uh, to give three points, very three words actually. You know, one is uh, a little confusion, uh, rebalance and globalization. How can we reach the target of rebalancing? It's a problem of how we both great countries to manage. Uh, globalization, which uh, well, when Professor Tsang mentioned the globalization may, made me uh, recall the book I read by uh, Harvard University, Mr. McBroy, uh, by title, in title of uh, Management of Globalization. Uh, his famous uh, the, the quotation is, uh, if I remember right, Motivation of uh, global 
organization is more or more international trade and international investment. And uh, multinational cooperation is the, is the vehicle of globalization. So I, I was a little confused how could we uh, manage the globalization uh, so as to rebalance our economies. Uh, I suggest as uh, Ambassador Hughes uh, did as four or five years ago as a task force, why not China and the United States in joint board to make uh, to organize a task force to uh, study globalization and study on how to rebalance our world economy. This is one, one point, this uh, confusion. The second I would uh, advise, I would like to advise both leaders, US and China, to focus on creating and taking advantage of opportunities to build on common interests in the Asian Pacific region uh, and as regard a member of uh, global concerns. Actually, this is did by uh, uh, Mr. Pat, Richard Pat in your book, right? So this is my uh, advice, second point. Focus on our common interests. Lastly, we are hopeful as I'm a student of Doak and a friend as well as a friend, whenever I uh, participate uh, together with Doak Barnett, by the end, he always said, I'm op optimistic about US-China relations. But in front of uh, optimistic, he always put one modify cautiously. So I would like to advise uh, here, uh, my friend and uh, the audience, we must be confident we, we will make the relationship uh, much better if we can uh, bridge the differences and uh, take advantage of the opportunities whenever, when, as soon as it arises. Uh, with this, I think we can conclude this, uh, this meeting and uh, please join me in giving a big clap to Ambassador Hughes.